Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Sankit Pisat. I am a gynecological laparoscopic surgeon practicing in Mumbai, India. And today we are going to be discussing one of the most frequently asked questions that patients come to us in the, in the outpatient department, which is, uh, do my fibroids require surgery? So before answering this question, it is important to know certain basic statistics about fibroids. Uh, not going in too much into technical details, suffice to say that about 40 to 50% of patients in their reproductive age, which means between anywhere between 18 to 45 or even up to 50 years of age, will have fibroids in the uterus. So 50% of patients, that means literally one in two women will have fibroids in the uterus. Now, a condition that is so common obviously cannot require surgery all the time. So yes, to answer that question, all fibroids do not require surgery and a majority of fibroids can be managed without surgery by medicines alone. So with that said, let us exactly look at what are those types of fibroids which actually require surgery. To understand this, we need to see what are the types of fibroids that are located in the uterus. Uh, not going too much into medical jargon, we usually try and classify these fibroids depending upon which part of the uterus they are located in. So to that effect, we have three or four different types of fibroids. The first one uh, is the fibroid which grows on the outside of the uterus. This is called as a sub serous fibroid and it grows towards the outer surface of the uterus. The second type of fibroid is called as the intramural fibroid and this grows within the wall of the uterus. The third type of fibroid is called a submucous fibroid and this grows inside the cavity of the uterus or close to the endometrial lining. Now, this endometrial lining is precisely where the pregnancy latches itself on and is also precisely where uh, which bleeds every month during the periods uh, so as to give rise to the menstrual bleeding. So let's take all these three fibroids one by one. The sub serous fibroid usually does not cause any symptoms. It keeps growing till it attains a large size but usually does not give rise to any symptoms. Some minor symptoms of this sub serous fibroid may be a very occasional dull aching pain or some sort of heaviness, but for the most part, these fibroids do not cause any symptoms at all. And hence, these fibroids can be left alone completely. Usually, the recommendation is until this fibroid crosses a size of about four or even five centimeters, it is not necessary to operate upon this fibroid at all. However, there are certain exceptions to this rule. One exception to this rule is the fibroid that will grow at an odd location and may compress an organ around the uterus. Particularly, uh, in front of the uterus in the human body lies the urinary bladder which houses the urine. Behind the uterus lies the rectum, which houses the fecal material. And uh, besides the uterus lies the ureter, which is the channel of urine from the kidneys all the way to the urinary bladder. A fibroid growing at any of these odd locations and compressing upon the ureter, bladder, or rectum typically means that it may affect the function of these vital organs in the future in case this fibroid grows very large in size. This is particularly found in fibroids that grow on the lower part of the uterus, something that we call as cervical fibroids or broad ligament fibroids. So that's the fourth variant that we were talking about, cervical fibroid or broad ligament fibroid. So any fibroid that is growing at any of these locations and has probably crossed a size of 4 centimeters or 5 centimeters is the fibroid that needs to be removed. Another indication for removing these fibroids, or rather any sort of fibroid, 
is a quick increase in the size of the fibers. By and large, of course, this again is not 100% fixed every time, but by and large, fibroids tend to grow at a rate of half a centimeter per year, at the most one centimeter per year. Anything that is growing faster than this can be assumed to be a non-normal tissue and hence probably may require surgery. So with that, coming to the point of why fibroids do grow in the first place, the answer to that is fibroids are a part of the uterine musculature itself. They are not foreign bodies, they are part of the uterine muscle itself. And it's only a small localized part of the uterine musculature that overgrows and leads to the development of these fibroids. It is very important to remember that for the most part, fibroids are not cancerous and not malignant in any way. And hence, the chances of finding a malignancy in a fibroid is very, very rare. It would be one in several thousands or even lakhs. So that's how rare the possibility of malignancy in a fibroid is. But one would suspect malignancy in case of fibroids that grow very quickly or in those fibroids which are seen to have a lot of blood supply being drawn by them, which is usually seen on an ultrasound or an MRI. So these are the fibroids that you need to watch out for. And these are the fibroids that probably require surgery early. So with that, we have talked about sub-serous fibroids. Let us now move on to the second variant of fibroids, which is the intramural fibroids. So essentially, intramural fibroids grow within the wall of the uterus. And then sometimes they migrate to the exterior, forming sub-serous fibroids or they migrate to the inside, the interior, forming submucous fibroids. These intramural fibroids, again, for mostly are asymptomatic, meaning they do not give rise to any symptoms at all. Occasionally, a patient may have slightly heavy menses, but mostly these intramural fibroids do not require removal, again, till they are about 2 or 3 centimeters in size. Some people even consider 4 centimeters as the cutoff. However, a word of caution in case of intramural fibroids, newer literature now suggests that for those patients who have infertility, are not able to conceive, removal of these intramural fibroids also significantly and positively affects the reproductive potential and patients are able to conceive better after these fibroids are removed. Also, success rates of IVF cycles improve after these fibroids are removed. So though intramural fibroids may not have a direct causation in anything, patients with infertility in whom all other factors of fertility, subfertility have been ruled out, may consider removing intramural fibroids also for some sort of fertility enhancement. It is important to note that subserous fibroids, the one which we talked about before, do not have any impact on reproductive outcome or do not have any impact on fertility. And hence, removing subserous fibroids for the sake of enhancing fertility is really not recommended. However, your gynecologist may recommend that you remove a large subserous fibroid or an intramural fibroid because. If you are planning pregnancy, then in that case, it is possible that during the course of pregnancy, the fibroid may further increase in size or may give rise to pregnancy-related complications. So as you can understand, with sub fibroids and intramural fibroids, there are a lot of cross factors that come into play while deciding whether or not surgery is required. So that would, to summarize, it would be size of the fibroid, location of the fibroid, how fast the fibroid is growing, how much blood supply the fibroid is drawing, and some other factors that your doctor will be able to actually examine and find out for sure. With this, we come to the third variant of fibroid, which is the submucous fibroids. Now, submucous fibroids are those which are indenting or pressing on the endometrial lining. 
naturally it would be easy to understand that when these fibroids are pressing on the endometrial lining they are going to affect the patient in two ways number one it is going to increase the amount of bleeding that the patient has during her periods so this is going to give rise to heavy menstrual bleeding secondly because it is compressing on the very area that the pregnancy is going to grow inside these fibroids are supposed to be directly responsible for infertility or subfertility and hence recommended removal of these fibroids is advised before natural conception or before ivf cycles thirdly some of these fibroids project right into the uterine cavity like a mass which is bulging and occupying the entire endometrial cavity these fibroids are called as submucous fibroids but a further extension of submucous fibroids which we term as fibroid polyps these fibroid polyps other than causing everything that we talked about in submucous fibroids are also responsible for a significant amount of pain because the patient's body feels that these are foreign bodies and tries to expel them from the uterus so patients with fibroid polyps have got not only heavy menstrual bleeding but also a lot of pain during the periods so we talked about all the different types of fibroids and when they are to be removed how exactly do you remove them uh, how much of stay is required in the hospital is the procedure entirely safe or not what exactly is the approach to the procedure that we do what kind of rest does the patient require after surgery we'll be covering all these topics and more in some of our subsequent videos so if you like this video please click on the icon to subscribe to our channel and to keep receiving more updates thank you